Good day, everyone. We are now in conversation with Michael Giraud, who is the head of Standard Bank Offshore Trust Company, Jersey Limited, having previously been a director and a shareholder of a multi-jurisdictional trust and family office business working with global families with a particular focus on Africa, the Middle East and the UK. Named as a top 35 under 35 on multiple occasions by Pam Insight. He's also been recognized as a future leader by City Wealth and recommended as a trustee by the Global Elite published by Legal Week in 2021. Michael regularly makes contributions to industry-specific publications. In his work in particular, he works with structures holding residential and commercial property, large complex investment portfolios, directly held private equity and family companies in the regions we've mentioned. Michael, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Let's talk about what a PTC is, a private trust company. Thank you for the introduction. That was um, quite wonderful. I felt quite important <laughs> now. Um, a PTC, um, it's in its most simple form, it's, it's a company which is incorporated expressly to be a trustee of a group of family trusts, so a group of connected trusts. Um, that sounds very simplistic, and at that level it is. Uh, what's important, though, is that the PTC has uh, an anchor into the jurisdiction in which it's resident. So what will happen there is that company which has been incorporated will have a service provider such as Standard Bank, uh, who are regulated in, in Jersey, who are the registered office of the company, who will be the company secretary and who will also administer the PTC. Um, ideally as well, we would ask for a presence on the board of the PTC. And this is really one, it helps uh, reduce risks. And two, it's also because what we have to remember is if something is a trustee, it should be making trustee-like decisions. Mm. And um, we do this day in, day out. And so this is the expertise which we bring to the board of the PTC. All right. Now, is there a particular kind of family that ought to think about setting up a PTC? First of all, I'd start with saying no two families are ever the same. Every single family is very, very different in terms of that dynamics in, in the family, the culture, the residency of the people who are beneficiaries of the trust, uh, the terms of the assets they hold, the businesses they hold. So even though I say this, you do tend to see a trend, yes. Uh, so firstly, I'd expect the family to be an old ultra high net worth family, which by definition is over $10 million. So roughly 200,000, sorry, 200 million Rand. Um, but the reality is they probably have a much greater net worth than that. It would typically be the mother or father. So the matriarch or patriarch who, who formed the PTC for the benefit of their, uh, probably their children, grandchildren who tend to be resident all over the world. So it's not uncommon to have, for example, a family in South Africa who might choose to uh, establish a PTC. And actually they have uh, three children. One lives in Dubai, one lives in the UK, and one lives on the West coast of the US as an example. What we tend to find is these families tend to hold a broad spectrum of assets. They don't just have a house and investment portfolio. They will hold all sorts of things, uh, all of which are all over the world as well. And um, what you'll find as well is they will have either implemented a family charter or looking to implement a family charter as they progress further on. So those are the typical trends I'd see with a family who uh, want to establish the PTC. And then in terms of the structure of that PTC, what would it look like? It's probably best demonstrated visually. Um, so by way, um, I believe there's a diagram and um, a PTC will normally be held by a trust called a purpose trust. Uh, the sole purpose of this trust is to hold shares in the PTC. Uh, this trust will be settled by what's called the set law. So again, referring back to the matriarch or patriarch I, I referenced earlier. Um, the PTC will then be trustee of a number of trusts, which, which will be connected to the same family. Each trust may have different beneficiaries or might serve a different purpose and may hold different assets. So you could have one trust, uh, which, for example, holds uh, luxury assets such as an aircraft or a super yacht. You could have one trust which holds a family business, which has been in the family for a number of generations, could be second, third generation family uh, business. Um, you could have a third trust, uh, which uh, receives the excess liquidity from the, uh, the family business. Uh, trust and the reason for that is you you want you want to segregate your personal assets from your business assets. It's about ring fencing and protecting them from any 
future attack from creditors. It's um, quite possible the family has a charitable trust. This is quite quite common where families want to try and evolve the second and third generation so they can start to learn a bit about the wealth and what it means to have wealth and what it means to do good with the wealth. Uh, that trust might have a grant committee. And um, you might have, again, I mentioned a family member living in the US. It's not uncommon for people to move to the US, acquire green cards, to have children born in the US. And so the planning for that trust would need to be very different to the other trusts. So you'd have a maybe a separate trust for that. Within that, um, you'd have Standard Bank who'd be providing services, the Purpose Trust, the PTC, the trust and the underlying companies as well. Um, the underlying companies being the holding companies a resident in an offshore jurisdiction. That is a very, very simplistic view of a PTC. <laughs> So in terms of the structure that you've described and explained to us, and as you say, it's a very simplistic uh, explanation, are there variations to this then? There's always variations and all the different offshore jurisdiction always thinking of new and clever ways of implementing offshore planning. Um, what I'd say is I've seen differences in terms of the ownership structure. So you can have a, a PTC held by a foundation, which is, which is good because it's, it's, um, it's an orphan structure. Uh, you could have the PTC owned by an individual. Uh, you could have the PTC owned by a company limited by guarantee. Or you could completely change things. What I've seen happen uh, recently, or at least we talked about recently, is what's called a private trust foundation, where instead of having a company uh, incorporated to act as your trustee, you actually have a foundation. The benefit of this is it won't need a shareholder because the foundation is a corporate entity in itself. Uh, so it's a legal entity in itself. And so the person who settles the underlying trust at the same time can establish the foundation. That is less common and it's very much new planning. Um, what I'd perhaps say is I'd, I'd stick with what's known. Um, it's just me being, being quite conservative. So I'd stick with a, a traditional PTC. Now, the minimum requirements, I mean, you, when you gave your example, you said you're speaking in this context about ultra high net worth uh, families, but um, what would be the baseline for you to establish a PTC? Historically, I would have probably said about 100 million plus by 100 million dollars, I mean, and that's because of the cost associated with running the structure historically and because it was deemed quite new planning. Um, I, I've seen them implemented for a lot less these days. And it's more about the rationale for establishing uh, the trust and the, the, the sorry, the PTC. Um, I would say probably you could probably do one for around 20 million. I mean, costs really have, 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 have come down. People have more and more of these structures. They're more used to administering and administering them, the governance associated with them. Um, I'd say around about, about 20 million, but it depends on the asset class as well and how, how, how many entities there are. Okay, fair enough. You've given us a broad range there. Now, what benefits does a PTC have over a standard trust structure? A standard trust obviously has so so many benefits. Uh, and by standard trust, that would be Standard Bank itself acting as the trustee of the trust. So by bringing a PTC in, what you're doing is you're bringing in your own, own trustee. So what that means is should you wish to change your service providers to say you tire of standard bank or another service provider you wouldn't actually need to appoint a new trustee all you need to do is appoint a new administrator because to the ptc um standard bank would 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 uh, have an sla and they would be administering the, un the underlying trust as opposed to being the actual trustee so what you get is portability and uh, what you also get is on the board of a ptc you can have close advisors and confidants and maybe family members as well, subject to the tax consequences of this. And what this means is you can get more control over the underlying assets. Um, it has to be legitimate, it has to be done properly, which is why I referenced earlier, you know, trustee needs to make proper fiduciary decisions. But so you essentially get portability and, um, and control. Uh, what you might see sometimes is a trustee company against such a standard bank, uh, which would be saying, we we'd rather have the assets you're proposing to hold through trust through a PTC. And the reason for that is it might be contentious. There might be a, a, a known element of contention there, which could result in ongoing litigation or something. So quite often a trustee, not just order to distance themselves a bit from a known quantity, they would ask for the assets to be put into a private trust company. 
Now, are there any pitfalls, Michael, especially pitfalls to avoid when establishing a PTC? Yes, there are. Uh, you would not be, well, you probably would be very surprised to um, know that despite the wealth I've been talking about, which is required to establish these structures, uh, people are not adverse to trying to cut corners. <laughs> and cutting corners never actually pays off dividends in the long term. So the biggest pitfall, I'd say, is um, take advice when establishing a, a PTC structure. So you can make sure that it works from a tax perspective, and also it's fit for purpose in the long term. And the reason I say that is patriarchs and matriarchs tend to be a glue which hold the family together. Uh, should they pass away, uh, it's not uncommon for beneficiaries to fight. Um, and even when it gets down to third generation, uh, the reason I say is, for example, cousins won't be as close as siblings are. And um, you want to make sure that there's mechanisms in the PTC structure to account for all the probabilities which might happen should people start fighting. And invariably, unfortunately, wealth tends to do that to family sometimes. It can be quite, quite destructive. Once you've sourced your advice, um, what I'd say is make sure that it's properly implemented. There's no point in spending all this money on getting this legal and tax advice and having a trustee who doesn't actually know what they're doing. So uh, a service provider who doesn't know what they're doing and then implementing it correctly because this can result in potential tax uh, implications, it can, in, uh, it can result in, in investment losses, it can result in all sorts of, of consequences. Um, and then thirdly, what I'd say is um, cheap is not necessarily good. And I, I say this again is because quite often when speaking to families, um, and I'm saying this through my past, past experience, is they will try and, and, and squeeze you down on fees. And um, they'll end up sometimes saying, well, do you know what, I'll go with the guy down the road who's £5,000 cheaper, which is fine, but the guy down the road might not, not necessarily know what he's doing. Uh, he might not have implemented any PTC structures. Uh, he, his firm might not be able to, to properly uh, administer the structure. And I've seen this result in quite large tax charges, because well, they haven't done the filings they should they haven't administered assets properly. They haven't monitored the investments. And so what I'm saying is um, cheapest is not always best. Go for go for quality. Uh, and you know, I've I've been set in, 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 in meetings uh, and negotiating fees where clients have had watches on their arms for 50, 60,000 pounds and they're haggling over three, 400 pounds. I mean, that, that, that doesn't really amount to much really. Okay, so when we're talking about quality then, I want you to explain to us what is the cost for quality? How are these fees typically charged? Again, I referenced earlier that I used to say about 100 million for a trust structure. Obviously that's come down over the years as, as we've gained synergies and technology and we've just become more accustomed to them. Um, I've seen PTC structures established for as little as 25,000 pound, which in RAND terms, I appreciate still sounds like a lot. Uh, but I've seen some um, charge as much as £600,000 a year in, in terms of yeah, it's quite a large number. But those are very big, very, very complex structures where there's all sorts of very, very complex assets and tax issues and all sorts of things to, um, to take into account. What I'd say what has a bearing on, on, on the fees is the family behind it, what their profile is, how they've earned their wealth. Um, where are the beneficiaries, residents, uh, what are the types of assets held in structure, uh, where is their situs, so where, where are they based, is it in the US, is it UK, is it SA, is it Uganda, is it Kenya, is it Nigeria, I mean, is it UAE, they could be all over the place. Um, the type of reporting required, so that's, that's not just the typical FATCA CRS reporting, um, but also uh, the financial reporting, if there's interim reporting, are the third party directors, the third party service providers, and quite importantly, um, which banks are working uh, with the family. And the reason I say that, speaking as a trustee here, is um, certain banks in certain jurisdictions make a trustee want to cry um, when, when they suggest we open accounts to them or work with them because it is so complex and so difficult just to establish the relationship. So all that has a, a bearing uh, on the fee. But what I'd say, just just finish this bit off, is um, when speaking to 
a offshore provider, such as Standard Bank, of course, um, try and get a fixed fee. So what they should be able to do is they should say, okay, well, we have all these complex assets. We have these people resident all over the world. We have all these trust structures and these, these companies, holding companies. They should give you a fee, a fixed fee for the basic administration. And the basic administration will be your FACA filing, your CRS filing, your substance test, your, your LEIs if required, your accounting, your bookkeeping, your investment monitoring, um, all those very basic things, the compliance reviews, annual reviews. So they should give you a fixed fee for that. And now what will typically happen is I'll say, okay, you have a fixed fee for that, but if you want to sell investments, buy investments, if people move to different jurisdictions, um, if we want to uh, restructure the structure, they'll do that on what's called a time spent basis. So essentially it's how a lawyer or accountant would charge and we charge our time for that. So that's typically what you'd see around the pricing. <laughs> okay. Now, ultimately what you're trying to do is to just, you know, make the family feel a little bit more comfortable about their assets and how they are managed. So. To achieve that, how does a PTC and a fiduciary provider, how do they typically complement a family office? Oh, there's so many ways. <laughs> um, what I've seen historically, um, I've seen PTC structures actually structure the family office. So the PTC structure would own the family office, which would then employ the staff, work for the family. People who service and do the administration for PTCs, we tend to be experts in administering assets because we hold all these assets through our structures. We hold commercial property, residential property, we hold the development property, the private equity, the investment portfolios, the planes, the yachts. Um, so we know how to administer these. So quite often what's possible is even if the assets aren't held through structures we look after, we can still administer the assets, which helps the family office. Um, we can do all sorts of consolidated reporting. Um, invariably, as a trustee for all our other structures, it's very important we know what assets we own and what the values are. So we have systems in place which we can leverage to do consolidated reporting for assets we, we're responsible for, but also which we're not responsible for. We can provide all sorts of governance services for for the family, generally the, fam the family office, um, we can help as a, a central depot for the collation of CDD, so the, the compliance documentation. Um, and that's not even what we could do as a wider standard bank. I mean, obviously, as, as a bank, we work with families all the time and there's all the banking, the leverage, the M&A stuff, the capital markets, uh, investments. I mean, there's so many ways which, which, which we can work together. So, Michael, obviously, I know, I know um, facetiously you kind of said they could go and speak to the guy down the road. I don't think anybody wants to just kind of casually speak to the guy down the road if they're not happy. So when a family is looking to select an offshore service provider, what is just some of the criteria? How do they go about doing it? The world is large and there's, uh, there's, there's service providers in all different jurisdictions. Uh, what I'd say to a family with this type of wealth is you want to make sure it's safe and you want to make sure that the provider is of a size where they'll be here today, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Um, so firstly, you wanna make sure your trustee has experience in looking after these types of families and these types of structures, um, because getting something wrong can be very, very expensive with these types of numbers. Um, ensure that they have strength and depth. So by that, um, it's not a, you know, a very small office that there's that the, this cover should something happen to someone. They they have teams of people. We have teams of people who do compliance and risk, and teams of people who do accounting and bookkeeping. We have legal teams. We have administration teams. We have teams of directors who look who look after these uh, these structures. There's real depth in the jurisdiction. Um, you want to make sure as well that they have good systems because doing things manually these days, especially again talking about this type of wealth, is insanely expensive um so you get some real cost efficiencies there um we mentioned fees make sure they're transparent with fees um it's not uncommon for someone to say look i'll do you a great fee of 10 pound 50 but actually when you start reading all the little print all the small print you really see that you're being charged very very much more so ask for transparency that should be very very possible in this 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 day and age um make sure the administrator has professional indemnity insurance. 
And by that, there's lots of smaller firms who um, have quite low values. I mean, they have quite large amounts of assets which they're a trustee of and which they administer. But actually, when you look at their professional indemnity insurances, it wouldn't cover any claims on that. And that's because that it, it's just so expensive to source in the markets and, um, and so difficult to source. So you want to make sure someone is able, if something does go wrong, it's their fault, they can cover the loss. I mean, otherwise, you just won't get the money back, to be quite frank. Um, there's been lots of cons consolidation in, in the industry. So make sure you know who they are. Is it a trustee who, who's, who's, who's going to be sold in a couple of years' time to a, a, a bigger provider? So maybe, you, so for example, you know who your trustee is today, but you know in three years' time, it could be a completely different firm. Make sure they're in a good jurisdiction with a very robust regulator. Um, and I, I can't overemphasize this. A good regulator really, really... You know, it, 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 it keeps a trustee on his toes and the organization's toes. It also increases the, the, increases the bar. So, you know, everyone's at a higher level. Make sure the provider has a good reputation with the regulator. They haven't been fined recently or they haven't got investigations ongoing. And what I'd say is go and visit these guys' offices. Don't just take their word for it. You know, if, if you're meeting someone from Jersey or from Mauritius or Guernsey or Isle of Man and say we're a great firm and we have strength and depth and we have a team of people, go and meet them. Go kick their tires because um, it's important that they really do say and do do what they say they do, if that makes sense. I think I just confused myself. Apologies. Um, and, and lastly, um, have a provider who travels into jurisdiction. I'm very much of the view that it's a very poor trustee and very poor offshore service provider who doesn't actually know who the beneficiaries are. So they need to travel into the jurisdiction and meet the family, see the assets, engage the family, understand the dynamics, the culture, and really how the family operates. And that is, I think that's a loss. It's a lot to process, but I think fundamentally, you know, look into everyone's eyes. You look into my eyes, I'll look into your eyes and we'll know. Thank you so much, Michael. Your insights on this topic, I think they've given us a much better understanding on the complexity of private trust companies and where one should consider implementing them in your structures. And it's also shaped our understanding a little bit more. Certainly, it has done mine. I appreciate your time, Michael Giraud. Goodbye and until next time.